Davina Paletto has a, a great experience across the board with financial services. So she, she's been an advisor, she has been worked with product providers, and she now works as a sales coach for financial advisors. So we, we discuss her journey when she was advising, what the experience was like, um, why she left, and um, what she's learned with uh, her, her role now, where she's been working with advisors on how to um, bring clients on and overcome uh, their own uh, challenges around, uh, I guess, the sales process. Talking about sales as, as not being a dirty word and why that's the case. And we just, we cover off a lot of different things around uh, psychology of engaging with clients, different personality types. So there's a few different things covered and I hope you enjoy it. This episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Launching nearly 20 years ago, this ASX-listed company is ranked number one for overall platform functionality and user satisfaction by investment trends for the past three years. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important now more than ever to embrace new technology and enhance the way you do business. With this change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives, and realize new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help you innovate in your business. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which clients should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. Davina. Adrian. We've been talking about having you on the podcast for a while now. Yes, a long time. Yeah, it's good to good to have you in here. Thank you. Good to be here. So, um, so where do we start? I guess, what have you been up to for the last few years? Like where, where have you come from? Where have I come from? Uh, so I have a background of probably about 20 years um, funds management, financial services um, experience, um, mostly in distribution. Um, and then I was a planner for a brief period mm-hmm. um, and uh, also worked for one of the big four for a couple of years. And uh, now oh, I've- sorry. Oh, <laughs> yes, exactly. It was, um, oh, look, great experience. Um, I'd recommend it to anyone, but uh, not for the rest of your life, perhaps. Um, so, um, and then, uh, you know, I found myself um, now, I, I think probably just coming from my planning experience, um, I found myself in just this sales enablement. Um, I've always had a passion for sales um, and obviously being in the financial advice space. Uh, I found myself just having, you know, gravitating towards um, financial advice sales, um, for want of a better word. So, a bit of a dirty word, but isn't it? Sales? Yeah. Uh, some some would argue yes, uh, but the way I kind of look at it, if I, you know, if I use the analogy of walking into any kind of retail store and, you know, a sales assistant is uh, you know, really good at what they're doing and they and they know what they're doing. Uh, and they sell me a you know a product or a dress that looks great on me, and I walk out looking great. Um, then obviously my needs have been met, and you know I'm a happy customer. So, mm-hmm. um, and somewhere along the lines, those somewhere along the way, those lines have been blurred in terms of, um, particularly in the financial advice space, um, where we 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 deem sales as a dirty word. Um, and I and I would argue against that because I think you know to be a true, truly you know great advisor and a, and a and a great salesperson is actually to identify the customer needs, uh, truly listen to the customer or the client, and um, and address those needs. The what did you dislike about the advice? Experience that you had. What? What? And don't be <laughs> don't be shy because like I guess there's. I think everyone out there will probably resonate with the, <laughs> a few of the, the points that you might make. Um, yeah, look, for me, um, I'm, I'm not going to hold back. I'll be really honest. Uh, for me, I loved actually sitting in front of the client and being able to help the client. Um, but what I didn't like was um, just the pace of, of regulation change mm-hmm. uh, that came through. So during the time that I was a planner, um, I went through uh, RBA, so Reasonable Basis of Advice and also Best Interest Duty. So, and that was in the space of so the FIFA reforms. And, that's right, and yeah. that was in the space of less than a year. So, um, just you know, trying to keep up with that with that regulation change was was obviously quite taxing. Um, but then also it you know and and it wasn't so much keeping up with the change; it was more um, just the disruption that that caused for me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can appreciate that you know is not for everyone. Um, change is inevitable. Mm-hmm. Um, but just for me personally, it had such an impact that 
whereby I, I kind of just really lost my confidence mm. in wondering whether I was actually providing the best advice to my clients. Well, I suppose I suppose one of the challenges is that um, well, there's two things. You you're first learning to be an advisor, mm. yes. and I guess uh, you talk to people who've been advisors for a number of years, and they're like, "Well, change is always here; it's always coming." But I guess when you're at the starting stage and getting knocked on the head with um, starting learning and then all of a sudden halfway through learning and not fully learning that original bit, mm. you're being told that things are completely different. Yes. And, yeah, I suppose that would – well, from I was, I was around – I started advice around the same time and, mm-hmm. yeah, it was, it, was char- it was tough. Like yeah, you sort of – and the confidence bit is definitely – I think that – really under, undermines your ability to be an advisor because it's it's really important to be confident when you are presenting, you're dealing with clients. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why, you know, I really gravitated towards the space that I'm in now. Um, it was really wanting an opportunity to to be able to provide. So I knew that I could, you know, sell a product. I knew that I could talk to clients. I knew that I could influence them in certain ways. Um and, and for the most part, I knew what I was talking about, but it was really, okay, mm-hmm. was that product the right one for them? And that's when I really started to question myself. So then I got into um, just that area of being able to provide confidence to other advisors. Um, and, and now I have that opportunity. I deal with a lot of great advisors and, and I think our industry in particular, and I, and I don't think any industry is immune to this, it's really, um, it's really just unfortunate that a few bad apples have just probably ruined it for a lot of really great advisors. Um, and I just really wanted to provide that confidence to those advisors who really do know what they're doing. Um, I have one guy that I'm working with at the moment. He works for a stockbroking wealth management firm. Mm-hmm. Great guy, super keen, super smart. Um, but just lacks the confidence in being able to have that conversation and that discussion with the client. Mm. Um, And just with a few coaching sessions with him, um, we were able to really turn that confidence around. Um, And he sent me a a note, sent me an email the other day and said, "Um, yeah, got these guys on board and um, now they're going to be doing some more things, Um, set up a CFS portfolio with them straight away. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was just over the moon. And And what was the the transformation? What triggered the the change in his, like, the outcome that he was getting? Uh, for him, it was it really was about the confidence piece. It was actually just highlighting that he he knew what he was doing, and it was having someone tell him that he knew what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And I think, like I said, given my background, um, when he kind of explained the scenario of of the couple that he was dealing with, uh, and thankfully he was dealing with a uh, Italian couple. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> given that's uh, my background, I, I knew a little bit about kind of you know where their where their trigger points like, were. I knew they were really deliver, heavy in property. The SOA and- with pasta. Or is it- <laughs> 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 yeah, that's it. And then you don't talk about shares, it's just all about property. It's all it? about property, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and it was just, you know, how do we actually formulate that conversation that's going to resonate with that particular client mm. and give him, and that's what's going to give him the confidence. He just needed that little kind of lever to get him into the right headspace. What do you think got him into that space of what was what what are some of the things like weighing down on you think may could have contributed to weighing down on that confidence um for him so it, it, he was in a fairly kind of boutique um firm and mm-hmm. office and i just don't think he had the support not not through any fault of the advisor um i think uh many offices in that situation like three or four you know um advisor strong offices, mm. they tend to not really, because I guess they're so stretched, they don't really have the time to actually um, people manage and succession plan mm-hmm. uh, and do all those types of things. Um, so for him, I really think it was just having that support there and having someone just telling him that, yes, he can do this. Mm. You know, he can. Well, I think you put your point on a, I guess you're touching on an area that I guess I might draw back to when you're learning and it was a sort of, it's around that administration, the requirements around advice. Mm-hmm. So you, you said that like you like the, the human element yeah, and absolutely. how far your impression of advice and what it would be, how far from that impression to what it ended up looking like for you was it? Um, On what you would be, what you would be doing from day to day sort of thing. 
Oh, so what was my perception of what planning would be and what the reality was? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Um, no, I think I think the perception and the reality were, were, were fairly aligned. Um, I think probably, you know, if I'm, again, if I'm really honest, you as an advisor, you end up doing, and perhaps now it's probably a lot different because, you know, we, we have the luxury of, um, you know, such advancements in technology, even in the last four or five years, um, you know, and power planning is so much more streamlined and, you know, things like X-Plan and things like that, um, you know, really, really help the advisor. Um, but for me, it was just this constant administration and I'm and because I'm such a people person I really mm. struggled with the administration part of it and you know being doing so much work for for no reward and no remuneration you know and that probably sounds um a little bit selfish um but yeah I just had no idea how much administration was involved in in all of that and then well, that's pretty much what I wanted to hear. I wanted yeah. to hear say, administration killed yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Because I was trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> hey, it's reality. Yeah. I, I, I think there's a huge gap between well, – it's a, it's a huge breadth of skill set if you are doing all the elements of delivering financial advice. Mm -hmm. And there is certain people that uh, have – certain unique people that can stretch across all of those areas and do them well. True. Um, but I would argue that it's only because they've developed certain areas where they were not naturally skillful in. Mm -hmm. So the majority of people aren't – it's just impossible for people to actually be competent across that whole spectrum of requirements. Mm. So when you've got a situation where you're going through all those elements, um, you've got the people skills, you've got the administration, you've got the strategy, you've got the research, you've got the attention to detail, you've yeah. got the um, – I guess the – consciousness of compliance and consistency around file notes and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Now, a lot of people tick all those boxes at once. <laughs> That's true. And I, yeah, I personally think that there's been, there's been a sad attrition of people that would have made great financial advisors through the journey um, that you went through. So yes. that learning journey, um, if, because of the environment that they had to – because of the, the breadth that they had to be across. Yeah. Um, I just think it, you when you create too much friction against people's natural abilities or natural preferences of doing things or skill sets, what they're good at, um, and force them to do things that they're not good at um, or naturally inclined to do, I think it just – that's what that's – what turn, that's turned a lot of good people off financial advice, which is a bit of a shame. And I think it, it's getting worse because of the education requirements. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, like the education requirements there are sort of necessary um, in a traditional world. Just <laughs> sort so. of necessary? <laughs> really? Well, <laughs> like it's always good to be educated, but <laughs> I know a lot of people that are educated and, and like, it, yeah, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the best metric of certain outcomes that you want to achieve. But like it, I think it's... Um, I don't know. It's sort of. I'm always. I'm always in two minds about it. That the new world, modern world, like it actually isn't necessary to know all that stuff. That's oh, for an advisor, um, yeah, to be to be across absolutely everything. Yeah, probably not necessary. You know, like I said, you've got um, you've, you've got power planners. You've got um, you know support to kind of help you with all of that stuff. Um, do you think if do you think if you had the right if you had, if you've slotted into, if your learning was in an environment where there was an admin assistant doing the research, there was a power planner writing the plan for you. <laughs> I know you, you make think, me sound like a princess. No, I'd like, <laughs> to me, i like, that's... Is it that obvious? <laughs> well, to anyone that's like really loves the front end and doesn't like the admin, like that's a setup that maybe they would still be an advisor. Would would have you, is there a potential, if you had that structure, you might have stayed in Yeah, advice? absolutely. And, and absolutely. And even, uh, so I have a really good friend. She works for um, one of the big super companies. Mm -hmm. uh, her and I talk about you know, financial services ad nauseum all day long. And um, she used to be a planner as well, but she is exactly in exactly the same boat, like super smart, um, but just was really turned away by the administration and the regulation. Um, so, yeah, if I wasn't in a more structured environment or if I had that support that someone was just kind of there telling me or coaching me to say, okay, well, this is going to get better and it's not, you know, and, and really explained um, the, I guess, the 
importance, um, oh, probably not the importance, but just, you know, just that regulation piece that really, it, it made sense, but it was just... Oh, the, the rules that they set, oh, they were un- you were able to understand them, but why were they there? Uh, not so much or? why were they there, but it was just kind of this, you know, this threat, this constant threat that, you know, if you didn't do the right thing that you were going to, you know, and you're dealing with, you know, some serious issues. You're dealing with people's finances. It's a, it's not, you know, something to be taken lightly. Mm. Um, and I think for me it was just I was just really sensitive to to all of that. Was it, was it the um, rules or was it actually I'd, the impact on the client that was? Uh, both. Yeah. yeah, absolutely both. Um, because even now I have uh, good girlfriends, um, particularly, you know, my female friends who, you know, come to me and say, you know, what should I do about this? I've got this super that I really want to roll over. Can you help me? Um, and I love being able to do that. I love being able to empower um, particularly females because they, they really put their head in the sand mm-hmm. when it comes to financial advice mm-hmm. um, and dealing with their finances. Mm-hmm. Um, so being able to help them even a little bit, um, even just be able to sort of direct them in the right direction or mm. or actually say, well, yeah, here, go and see my friend, you know, Adrian or Clayton. <laughs> um, you got to get some new friends. What's that? <laughs> you got to get some new friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is you know, I feel t- t- to me that's quite empowering. So, so yeah, I, I wouldn't mind touching on that gender side of things as well in financial planning. Sure. Because I don't think anything that we've talked about specifically has addressed anything particular in that space but what's what's your like obviously obviously there's a ratio um that's like what 20 to 30 percent women and 70 mm-hmm. percent men what's your perspective in terms of advisors yeah, yeah in yeah. terms of advisors mm-hmm. what um why and what do you think may happen over the next few years sort of thing um why do i think the ratio is is the way that it is um, it's a good question. I probably I don't know that I have the answer to that. Um, I wish there were more financial advisors or well, female financial advisors, um, but yeah, it just seems to have been for some reason dominated by by you know males still. Is it I don't know. Is it that sales sort of mentality, the outcomes focus, or the I don't know the different sort of mentality around what's required to. Um, to, I guess, bring you into advice, potentially the sales background of advice? Maybe, maybe. I, yeah, I really I really don't know because um, I, I, I guess, f- like, you know, I can only speak from a personal point of view. Um, it's, you know, it's just one of those things where, yeah, I'm probably a bit, bit different to, to most of because I've had such a strong sales background. Mm. So... Um, for me personally, it wasn't an issue, but um, okay. yeah. So did you did you feel like on that journey that you've been through was there was there in particular gender challenges that you felt you faced that really made it a lot more a lot harder than maybe what it could have been? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably uh, to your earlier point was really around the um, just that push to actually continually sell, but but in a really aggressive kind of way. Mm. Um, which again, this is why it brings me to the role that I'm currently in, which is really more about um, identifying how we can um, better serve the customer by identifying their needs um, and selling in a very ethical way um, and still getting the outcome that your customer or your client wants. Does that remove the necessity for the numbers game of sales? It doesn't remove the necessity. Um but I, you know, I kind of, I really think if you're continually doing the right thing, and um, you're continually servicing your client, um, and your activity levels are there, I mean, you've obviously got to be out seeing clients. Mm. Um, then, you know, the numbers take care of themselves. So with, so, I suppose, like, obviously, there's confidence levels. There's, is there just people that you see, like, well, they just, they need to just do more activity. Is that? Is it a oh, simple answer? Is absolutely. That sort of, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, like, reminds you of when you're first learning advice. You're like, just get on the phone. Just get on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, it's kind of like anything, really, isn't it? It's just consistency pays off. So, what do you what do you think will get more people into advice? Oh, that's a tricky question. Um, 
Do you think we need more people in advice? I do. I okay. do. I do. I think I think we need to get the cost of advice down yep. by maintaining advisors' margins, um, which means that there's a there's a larger addressable market yeah. um, because you've got more competitive pricing for advice because it's just continually been driven up, um, which narrows the addressable market in like uh, like in Australia sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the environment that sort of creates that and sort of creates that like number one the like the job to be enjoyable for someone um, I think you really you really need to have people I guess um, showing how enjoyable the job can be mm-hmm. um, which I think in the current environment has been quite difficult because <laughs> a lot of people are just dodging bullets half the time or ducking for cover hmm. Shit, what's coming through or? yeah well I think you know it's a great um because it's a great segue into what I was about to say next in terms of, you know, before we get more people into advice, um, I think we actually need to start to really address how the perception of a financial, what the perception of a financial advisor is, what what is it that they do, what is it that they can help me with. Mm. Um, because I, I still, even though I've, I've been out of advice for quite a long time, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I still think there's this perception, um, and this is just as an observer, th- that, you know, there is some dodginess going on in the financial advice space um, and that a lot of financial advisors aren't to be trusted. Um, you, know, yeah. you open the paper every day and there's something <laughs> there's something in there about someone doing something that's uh, not quite right. So Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that's definitely been a been a challenge but I think one of the I think what you're talking about before that was actually is actually more um, more pertinent more there's more substance to, that's that's a surface level thing in terms of image mm-hmm. um, amongst people but from my experience um, your your sales process or the way you're coming into contact with people mm-hmm. um, really cancels that out it, it might put a, a couple of barrier like an extra barrier in place in terms of earning that trust mm-hmm. but people have still they're still willing to talk to you because people want and need to talk to someone about this stuff and that that need and the like that fear around finances is strong enough to overcome uh, that sort of surface level perception of advice to drive them to at least talk to someone. Yeah. Now, what an advisor does after that point is what defines, um, like the, I guess, the penetration of advice in Australia, mm-hmm. and that's like what the offer is. What are they presenting? What are they? What are they selling the client? What's yeah. what's the what's the experience they're selling? And as you said, like the, there's a lot of different experiences that advisors are selling, mm-hmm. and it's a very diverse. Um, a diverse space. Um, traditionally, I guess, like you still talk to people, even people have gone and studied financial planning at university. I've talked to students, so like they, the perception is still, um, is still a strong perception around investments and mm-hmm. and things like that. And obviously, there's a shift away from that to, I guess, above above like there's the goals based sort of um, concepts, but there's also like cash flow it's it's the whole spectrum of financial services uh, financial advice that can be um, delivered mm. a more holistic approach the uh, the the way that that is communicated to people is probably key and yes like okay. i don't know how you guys advocate um because you because does does what you do sort of reach into how they communicate from their marketing collateral and and things like that or how they articulate their service what sort of Uh, Yeah, it can be anything. So, well, to give you an idea of the breadth of our content, um, so so our um, content is video based. So we provide, obviously, and it's based on the premise of the way that we learn as humans is obviously 10, 20, 70. So 10% is, you know, kind of audio visual kind of stuff, what we see in here. Um, 20% is um, what we kind of discuss with Mm -hmm. our, you know, with our significant others or our peers. Um, so it's like you and I having a conversation now. And then the other 70% is in the doing. So our content is largely based on um, providing you with some with a, with a video content. Um, then we provide you with some p- supporting resources around that. So that's um, your – you have that in – it's the same for the, each advisor that uses it, or um, it, it is the same. So the the, the framework is the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the breadth of content. Yeah. 
you could you could watch a you know a video as such. Um, you could probably watch one every week for five years and never repeat the. And this is content. this is learnings for the advisor themselves. There's nothing going direct to the client, or is it? Um, no, just for the just yeah, for the advisor. For the advisor, the, yeah. Uh, to actually have the conversation and open up the conversation with the with the client. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but not specific, obviously, just to we, – we have a fe- heavy focus on financial services, mm-hmm. um, financial services and banking, I should say. Um, but, you know, there's there's content in there for, for every industry. So ethics. Ethics is like a – I did the um, CFP1, the ethics course, mm-hmm. and it was like – and I'd studied ethics at uni, I think, before. Um, but it's really – it's a very diverse sort of like – especially in the academic area. Like it's, it's, it's got a lot of breadth to it because mm-hmm. there's a lot of different perspectives on what is ethical, um, what way of thinking is ethical, what True. way of acting is ethical. True. So what, what, is, what is the way you – how do you guys perceive ethics? And mm-hmm. like, yeah, tell us a bit about that. <laughs> uh, good question. Um, I, I don't want to simplify that topic and that notion. Are you going to come over and go, just do the right thing? <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but but really the focus is on the customer. It's um, focusing on the customer needs. So so the ethical, the ethical aspect, the way you guys, I guess, the ethics that you're talking about is the ethics of actually not having, you're not coming and going, well, this is what we're offering. There you go. Yeah, it's just moving from like, you know, nobody likes a, a, a product flogger and um, or a product pusher. Um, you know, none of us do. And and still it's so prevalent and I see it all day, every day. Um, and, and particularly, you know, I still work with a lot of, okay, I work largely with wealth management firms, um, but those wealth management firms can, um, can be tied in with some stockbroking firms as well. And I find... Um, you know, a lot of the stockbrokers as well that have this really kind of alpha male, nothing wrong with that, but a very kind of alpha male approach to um, sales. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, again, going back to our our earlier point, it's not listening to the client. It's just selling them a product and... This is what we've got. This is what we've got. This is what you need. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see many guys or guys or women um, (laughs) (laughs) doing pricing like that at all? Um, in kind of a consulting kind of way, consultative kind of way? Well, in a way where they're looking at, they're assessing what value they can deliver a client and then pricing accordingly to that. So the it's more as opposed to referencing um, a cost to deliver with margins, so productizing your service, mm. it's matching, uh, like making more money when you're delivering more value. Yeah, oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, of course there are advisors out there doing that. Um However, I think what's probably tough for an advisor in this current market is is differentiating that value. Um, so I, I think the you know the scope of of what's and and you've also got to obviously take into context what the client deems as what's valuable. Um, that's a, that's a, you know well, another, the perception of the value. That's right. That's another conversation. There's often itself. a gap there. Yeah, true. <laughs> They're true. You know, yeah. I, but look at what I'm going to do. Well, like it's amazing. Some, well, yeah. There are some. There are some. Um, you know, particularly if I take my my group of um, girlfriends, uh, you know, they'd probably think I was amazing if I rolled their super over, which we all know is a really easy task to do. But mm. um, you know, and some advisors, you know, charge like a wounded bull for for just doing that. So yeah. Well, that's that's always. I guess that's one of the things that opens up that's sort of like I guess an ethical debate in itself in terms mm. of um, people's willingness to pay for your services that yes. you've priced mm. um, versus the appropriateness of them actually paying for it yeah because a lot of people it's like when you go when people go shopping if they if they see something that they just they just want, like and and some people obviously people have different spending profiles, but some people will just like <laughs> really go yeah. pay for something really expensive <laughs> just because they think it's 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 a it looks good or yeah, like it's very a, true. So yeah, and then I, I guess the 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 running uh, perception at the moment is that well that's where the advisor should be stopping um, or denying the service. Yeah, which is an interesting dynamic because you sort of you sort of when you're learning you're learning to. 
shit, someone, like you're working your way up to actually just wanting, getting someone to actually wanting to pay for what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, that's right, and wanting to say yes. Yeah. Like, oh, you said yes, I wonder great. if someone will pay for me to be an advisor <laughs> for them. And that, that's where you're coming from. So you're coming from that place where, like, someone saying yes is a great thing and you just, you run out that and it's like, wow, that's yeah, awesome. And yeah. then you get into an environment where, like, shit, you got to say no. Mm. So I think, yeah, I, I always found that challenging. That's a, uh, yeah, it's different. <laughs> Especially when you, you strive so hard to get people to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> For them to say yes and then tell them no, it's, yeah. uh, it's tough. It it's is tough. tough. Especially yes. if you don't like saying no to stuff. That's, uh, That's true, yes. Yeah. You, have that, you have that problem sometimes. Oh, I could have yeah. that problem, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, so what's, what's the business called that you, you work with? Uh, so I work with a company called Sales ITV. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like I said, the, the content is... Um, uh, largely video based, mm-hmm. um, so all based on the cloud, mm-hmm. um, and we have you know various different products that um, appeal to either you know enterprise level um, sales training, um, right down to individual training. But also, um, uh, my probably focus is really around the um, SME market, so that small to medium sort of business space. Okay, so yeah. larger practices, you might say. Yes. So, yeah. like, how many how many advisors would you say? Oh, probably yeah, probably four to five upwards. Of, okay, you know. Cool. And how, how can people reach you if they want to know more? Um, so, well, they can just um, email me at davina at salesitv.com mm-hmm. um, or jump onto salesitv.com, the website itself, mm-hmm. and contact me via that way. Um, and great news, I think probably what will be particularly um, um, uh, attractive to your client base is we've just started to work very directly with the AFA. Um, and now we can, you know, we can provide CPD points for um, a lot of our, a lot of our products and a lot of oh, our nice. training courses. So I was that's talk exciting. of that going northwards of where it currently is, like up to like fifty CPD points for advisors. So that's, okay. um, that um, that could be quite handy. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, no, yeah, it is because, like I said, I think it's a, it's a really important. Um, education piece that a lot of advisors kind of forget. I think they think that just taking care of their client is enough, and you know, and 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 quite often it's not. It's just that capacity to um, to elevate you to the next level, to have a better conversation that's going to lead to a better outcome. Surprise and delight, you might say. Is that surprise, surprise and delight? Yes. That's where we're in the business of. <laughs> Thank you for coming on, Davina. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.